Season 2 of A People's History of Kansas City is brought to you with the support from the Mid-Continent Public Library. You're listening to A People's History of Kansas City, a podcast from KCUR Studios. I'm Suzanne Hogan. Kansas City takes a lot of pride in claiming Walt Disney as a famous homegrown talent, even though Walt Disney was originally from Chicago. But Kansas City was a place where Walt spent many pivotal years developing his animation style and craft and important friendships. This is the place where it's said he came up with the vision for Mickey Mouse, the iconic cartoon that's now at the head of one of the largest media conglomerates in the world. Walt Disney made a living off of taking risks, dreaming big, and being a passionate storyteller. But here's the thing, Walt Disney didn't create Mickey Mouse alone. And the story he told for years about how he came up with the mouse just isn't true. I realized, oh, Walt Disney didn't come up with Mickey Mouse. Walt Disney popularized him and made him a star, but Walt Disney's best friend, a guy I've never heard of with a very unusual name, came up with Mickey Mouse. To know the true story behind Mickey Mouse and the pathway to a lot of Walt Disney's success is to know the story of his best friend, Ub Iwerks, an animator born and raised in Kansas City, Walt's artistic partner for years. He's actually the person who first drew and created Mickey Mouse. You could tell the story of Mickey Mouse through this friendship, and Mickey is basically the child of two dads. Ub Iwerks never got the credit he deserved during his lifetime. He was a legend in the animation world, sure, but the rest of us only started acknowledging how important he was after his death. And there's still a lot of work to do. Few Kansas Cityans know his name, even though this is the city where he grew up, the place where he taught himself animation in the first place. In his career of over 50 years, Ub had over 200 film credits, and he created the special effects behind many iconic Disney movies. Aside from Mickey Mouse, there was Mary Poppins, 101 Dalmatians, and my personal favorite, Sleeping Beauty. He also had a hand in virtually every attraction at the first Disneyland. All of this brings up one big question. If Ub Iwerks was so important, why don't we know about him? Or at the very least, why doesn't Kansas City know him? Our producer Mackenzie Martin set out to figure out why. You know that scene in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds where ravens attack the main characters? That was Ub. It earned him an Academy Award nomination. They got a call from Alfred Hitchcock saying, we've got this incredible movie with these amazing scenes that we have no idea how we can possibly film. One of the problems, for instance, was that they needed ravens to attack. But ravens are not angry birds. So Oob's solution was realizing, well, you know who is it? A terrible bird, a seagull. So they filmed seagulls against a black background, and that's what you see attacking Tippi Hendren in The Birds. Author Jeff Ryan was actually so impressed by the story of Ub Iwerks when he first learned it, and shocked at how little attention it's gotten over the years, that he wrote an entire book about him. It's called A Mouse Divided, how Ub Iwerks became forgotten and Walt Disney became Uncle Walt. He was the person who was doing most of the behind the scenes work, and when Walt was taking credit, Ub was the one who was denied credit. What's especially impressive about him was that he was equal parts artist and engineer. He was always thinking about how he could do things better and faster. If you're someone like Walt Disney, he was the perfect guy to have around. But part of it for Ub was the chase. Once the problem was actually solved, sometimes he lost interest. There is a famous story in animation circles about Ub Iwerks' brief love of bowling. He got a bowling ball, he joined a league, and he decided to start bowling on a regular basis. And he got better and better and better until one day he bowled a 300 game, a perfect game. He bowled 13 strikes in a row. He had effectively solved bowling. So he put his ball in the bag, put the bag up on the shelf, and he never bowled again. He was also an expert archer and painter. Once he built an 18-foot sailboat in his backyard... Another time, he supposedly dismantled his car and reassembled it over the course of a weekend. Part of what drove Ub's work was creating better processes. Back in the 1920s, when animation was just starting out, 
he developed a number of shortcuts that dramatically changed the game for animators everywhere. Like, he figured out that you didn't have to animate every single frame of a sequence. You could repeat some things. If you wanted to show someone dancing, for instance, you could repeat the series of frames where they dip their partner and come back up. And you could do this again and again. So if you had 130 frames in a sequence, sometimes you could get away with only actually drawing 40. A lot of this may seem obvious now. But back then it was, it was much, much harder. He really did pave the way for, for a lot of things that we see today. Ub's granddaughter, Leslie Iwerks, is an Oscar-nominated filmmaker today, in part because she literally grew up in the industry. Her dad, Don Iwerks, followed in his dad's footsteps and worked at Disney for nearly 35 years. Ub died when Leslie was only one. But from an early age, Leslie was fascinated by her grandfather. So in junior high, she decided to do a book report on him. But something weird happened. The stories she was reading in animation history books didn't match up with the story she had heard from her family growing up. The story of Ub and Walt's collaboration was missing. So Leslie spent years studying her grandfather's cartoons, learning about his style and sense of humor, and interviewing people that knew him for a documentary she called The Hand Behind the Mouse. I just wanted to clear that history. And I really wanted to also tell the story of Ub's contributions to Mickey Mouse. Ub didn't just draw him either. He created Mickey Mouse to be easily drawn over and over again. If you've got change in your pocket, you too can draw Mickey Mouse the way Oob Iwerks drew him. In long shots, I believe Mickey Mouse's ears are a dime and his head is a nickel. And then in close-ups, Mickey Mouse's head is a quarter and his body is another quarter and his ears are dimes. As a result of this, Mickey looked the same in every frame, regardless of who was actually drawing him. To really tell the story of Mickey Mouse, though, you have to look first at the friendship that created him. It's a story of two dads, and it starts in Kansas City back in the 1900s. Ub Iwerks was born here in Kansas City and grew up poor. And while we know him as Ub today, that's U-B, he was originally born U-B-B-E, pronounced oob, according to Jeff. But like I said, today, most people call him Ub. He was first introduced to film by his dad, a German immigrant, an amateur inventor. Then, when Ub was only 14, his dad left, leaving him to be the sole provider for his young mother. His father had, had left them and left them for, out for dry, basically, and so that's why he had to kind of quit high school and go get a job and uh, support his mother. Leslie says her grandfather's childhood was tough. From an early age, Ub was fascinated with the idea of bringing still images to life. But his mom wanted him to focus on a more stable, high-paying career. And this was ironic because Oob held steady jobs throughout his entire life and always was well paid for his work, so his mom was worrying over nothing. He got his first real job at a commercial art studio, and that's where he met fellow 18-year-old Walt Disney. Though at the time, Jeff says he was going by the name Walter Diz. It was actually Ub who was just like, just go by Walt Disney. What followed next was a series of extremely ill-conceived and failed business concepts. Their first venture was as commercial artists, under the name iWorks Disney. It lasted a month. Then, desiring a salary again, they both got jobs at the Kansas City Slide Company, where they borrowed the company camera and tried their hand at animation, making a few films for the Newman Theater downtown. Ub drew many of these short films, which they called Laughograms, and they eventually led to their first official studio. The Laughogram studio still stands in Kansas City today at 31st Street and Forest Ave. But it's less lively now. Back then, it was a hub where a whole team of guys were cranking out cartoons. I mean, the, uh, the owners were Ub and Walt, and they were 21 years old. And they recruited these 18-year-olds with an ad in the paper that said, if you'd like to draw cartoons, come to the Laughogram studio. Butch Rigby is the chairman of Thank You Walt Disney, a Kansas City nonprofit that's actually in the process of restoring the old Laughogram studio. There's a great picture of all of these guys at the Laughogram studio up on the roof shooting a film uh, with the cameras and the action, and there's pictures of them at Loose Park. And 
I have seen some of these loose park photos. It's immediately clear how much fun all these guys were having. Climbing trees, pushing each other around, often doing all of this with a tobacco pipe in their mouths. Later on, Ub and Walt both had these similarly iconic mustaches, but here they're both young and clean shaven. Many of the early Laugh-O-Gram animators would become pioneers of American animation. Rudolph Ising and Hugh Harmon were the early minds behind Warner Brothers cartoons and MGM cartoons. And then there were people like Carl Stalling, the prolific composer behind Looney Tunes. You know, Ub was quiet, but a genius. And I mean, literally a genius, and Walt recognized that. Ub was an engineering genius, with the ability to see any problem in any machine. Jeff Ryan says Ub looked at animation as just another series of machines, constantly refining how to make lively characters with as little effort as possible. We need to make 24 drawings that are all slightly different from each other. What's the way that we can do that that connotes the most liveliness of character that doesn't take a week and a half? Can we do it in a week? Can we do it in three days? Can we, in fact, do it in one day with two people? Walt had a different sort of genius. He was a managerial genius, an inspirational genius. He wasn't very good at drawing, but he was an incredible storyteller, and he knew how to get the best out of other people. And when you put Walt and Oob together, they were able to do just about anything. The Laugh-O-Gram studio was far from profitable at the time, but it laid the groundwork for Ub and Walt's future collaborations. The 1922 Little Red Riding Hood short, for instance, features Julius the Cat, their first real character. Then, they took on their most ambitious project yet. They decided they wanted to put a real person in a cartoon world. People had already put cartoon people in the real world, but this had never been done. They called it Alice's Wonderland, and it's truly fascinating. A four-year-old girl, played by Kansas City's own Virginia Davis, ends up in cartoon land, where she runs away from cartoon lions and disappears down a cartoon rabbit hole. all in 1923. As I mentioned though, literally none of these projects were actually making money. Walt had convinced Ub to put his own money into the studio, but eventually the money ran out. Walt declared bankruptcy, and Ub was out $1,000. And what happened next was one of the first in a pattern that would play out for decades. The story of Walt and Ub's collaboration is this. Ub invents things, but it's often Walt that takes it to the next level or fully capitalizes on it. When the Laugh-O-Gram studio went belly up, Walt doubled down on his animation dreams. With $40 in his pocket, he took a train to California and joined his brother Roy out in Hollywood. Meanwhile, Ub made a more practical decision. He went back to the company where he and Walt had previously worked and was actually promoted to the head of the art department. If you were happy in Kansas City, that would probably be a decent job, especially given his mother was not keen on him being an artist. Not very much time had passed, though, before Ub got a message from Walt, begging him to go out to Hollywood to help draw the Alice comedies. See, Walt had convinced young Virginia Davis's family to move out to California, but the cartoons weren't as good without Ub. In order to make them a success, Walt needed Ub. Leslie calls this moment the turning point in her grandfather's life. Up could play it safe, or he could uproot his entire life. You know, the track record for Walt succeeding at that point hadn't quite hit. <laughs> so here, here Up could relocate entirely and, and it wouldn't, you know, necessarily lead to something. Ultimately, we all have a friend like Walt though, right? Walt is absolutely the guy that says, come on, we're going to go on an adventure. And Ub is the guy who's like, we got in so much trouble last time. Up went back and forth, but eventually, the part of himself that wanted to animate won out over the part of himself that thought he should be practical. So in 1924, he moved to California with his mother and became Walt's top animator. Many people think that Mickey Mouse was the two's first hit character once they got out there, but it was actually Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Designed by Ub, Oswald was the slightly more devilish precursor to Mickey, and he looked a lot like him, too. He was a little bit more aggressive than the characters that came before. Things would explode or bombs would go off, and you know, but that was the fun of animation in those days. You didn't think about 
violence or anything in any sort of serious way. It was just silly fun. A lot of the early gags were directly inspired by Ub's Kansas City roots. He had a particular affinity for barnyard humor, specifically gags involving cow udders. And Oswald was popular, which is actually kind of what ruined everything. See, Oswald was way more successful than Universal Pictures predicted. And even though Walt and Ub created him, Walt didn't own Oswald. So a producer decided his best play was to cut Walt out and steal all of his animators. And it almost worked, except for one thing. Oob said, no, I can't do that. This is my best friend of 10 years. I'm not going to stab him in the back and leave like that. But pretty much everyone else left, including fellow Laughagram animators Rudolf Ising and Hugh Harmon from their Kansas City days. It was especially hard on Walt. And he's furious and upset and decides he's never going to have a boss again. He meets up with Oob and they say, we need a new character. And this is, this is the origin story of Mickey Mouse. How Ub and Walt created what would become the face of one of the largest media conglomerates in the world. That's after the break. Interested in learning more about today's episode? The Mid-Continent Public Library has you covered. Head over to mymcpl.org slash phkc to connect with behind-the-scenes looks at a making of a people's history of Kansas City, as well as companion reading lists, upcoming local history programs, and other great library resources. Hey there, Suzanne here. Are you liking this episode about the story behind Mickey Mouse? You might also like our episode about Jim the Wonder Dog, a seemingly psychic dog who blew people's minds during the Great Depression. Check it out. And if you're a fan of the podcast and feel so inclined, do me a favor and rate it, write a review, and better yet, share it with your friends. Okay, thanks. Back to the mouse. You know how sometimes a historic moment doesn't feel historic in the moment? That's kind of how Mickey Mouse's true origin story went down. To recap, Walt Disney Studios was about to lose its flagship character, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, to Universal Pictures. And all of Disney's animators, except Ub, had given their two weeks notice. It was an extremely tense, stressful time. Ub and Walt had nothing, except the knowledge that they had to act fast, and whatever they made had to be good. So while the departing animators were finishing out their contracts, Ub worked with Walt behind a locked door to sketch out the new character. Oob starts drawing animal after animal after animal. They know they can't use a rabbit because that was an old character, but what else can they do that has a similar biped form? So they try a frog, they try a horse, they try a cow. And they decide on a mouse. That's pretty much it. And while Walt did eventually define Mickey's personality and literally voice the cartoons over the following years, the drawing was all up. Ub animated the first Mickey Mouse cartoon single-handedly. After a record 700 drawings a day, he accomplished in two weeks what would take other animators months. But Walt was nothing if not a great storyteller. The story of Mickey Mouse that he told got wilder as Mickey grew in popularity. The only problem was that none of it was true. Walt, because he was never satisfied with anything, kept on making up bigger and bigger whoppers to, uh, to stretch the Mickey Mouse creation story. And the biggest whopper at first was that Walt was the one who did it. He didn't do it. That being said, Jeff says Walt was far from the first storyteller to embellish a character creation story like this. I mean, Walt and Mickey were the face of the Disney company quite literally. We've been trained to expect these kinds of elaborate origin stories. Allow me to run through some of the legends quickly. A popular one is that Walt drew Mickey on a train home to California, right after he learned the news about Universal's takeover. But Leslie says her grandfather himself debunked this one. He said that it was not Walt creating the character on a train. So that was a very different story than the Disney company had put out or that Walt started telling, you know, after Mickey became successful. Mickey was also supposedly named Mortimer at first, but Walt's wife Lily thought Mickey sounded tougher. This one actually checks out, at least partially. Then there's my personal favorite story, that Mickey was inspired by a real-life mouse at the Laughagram studio, back in Walt and Ub's Kansas City days. Walt had trained the mouse to do some tricks and was quite fond of it, but he had to let the mouse go when he moved to L.A. 
In other retellings, author Jeff Ryan says Walt's desk contained multiple mice. The mouse story, by the way, is the story that Butch Rigby of Thank You Walt Disney still stands by today. But ultimately, he thinks... The specifics are really not important. But what is important is the fact that, A, it looked a whole lot like the rabbit that they lost. And now that, I can verify, is true. Mickey was like a cuter version of Oswald. He just had rounder ears and a slightly different body shape. Mickey wasn't an overnight success, though. The first Mickey Mouse cartoon, Playing Crazy, was first seen in the spring of 1928, inspired by Charles Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic. Then later that year, there was the Galloping Gaucho, but neither of them took off. Some people might have given up at this point, considered another character, but not Walt. He doubled down. The movie most people think of as the first Mickey Mouse cartoon was actually the third. It was called Steamboat Willie, and the only reason it took off was because it was one of the first fully synchronized sound cartoons ever. I think that was a bold choice, an expensive and risky, financially risky choice, but that was Walt. He just didn't want to spare any expense to get them on the map. To really give you a feeling of how truly revolutionary this moment was, I want to play a clip from Comedy Central's Drunk History episode about this. So Steamboat Willie comes out and it blows audiences away. Narrated by a drunk Derek Miller. They went, I can see that mouse whistling. I can hear the mouse whistling. Oh my God, this mouse is whistling along with what his mouth is doing. This f***ing sink sound. There were standing ovations. Mickey Mouse became an icon overnight. He was referenced in movies and songs, and it creates Disney. Like, this in embellishes their minds to everybody. They know that this is like, the game has changed. No one was more thrilled by Steamboat Willie's success than Ub and Walt. Less than a year after they had lost Oswald and their staff to Universal, New Mickey Mouse cartoons were getting top billings over feature films. This was also around the time when Mickey Mouse became a fully developed character with a cohesive personality. Prior to this, there were two Mickey Mouses, Walt's Mickey and Ub's Mickey. Walt's Mickey is the, the man about town. Walt's Mickey is the perfect citizen, the guy who goes around helping his friends and neighbors, who's always up for helping out the less fortunate, who's always going to stand up to a bully. And then there's Oob's Mickey. Oob's Mickey was the man of action. Yeah, Oob's Mickey was definitely like crazy. Team, but Willie is like throwing the pig around and, you know, Ub definitely had a more raucous kind of adventurous, freeform, anything goes attitude. And what's interesting about that is that's not who Walt and Oob were. Walt was not the man about town. Walt was the man of action. And Oob was the, the gentle, generous soul who helped everyone else out that he met. So Walt's idea of Mickey's personality was Ub a gentle helper, someone you could always count on. And Ub's idea of Mickey's personality was Walt, a man of action who took charge and went after what he wanted. Does it mean they just admired each other that much? In the end, it was actually the combination of Walt and Ub's two Mickeys that made him such a popular character. But as for Walt and Ub's differences in real life, eventually, that's what tore them apart. At this point, Ub had also started animating Silly Symphonies, a cartoon animated to fit a pre-recorded musical score by composer Carl Stalling, who Walt and Ub had met back in Kansas City. The first cartoon of the series, The Skeleton Dance, was almost single-handedly animated by Ub, and it shows. At least one animator has referred to his style as Iwerks Gothic, because you never knew what was going to happen next. But shortly after the debut of the series, Ub and Walt's artistic differences came to a head. There are a lot of rumors about what was going on around this time, but the gist of it was that Walt was a serious taskmaster. Walt had begun to micromanage Ub. He started doing things like rewriting Ub's exposure sheets, and changing an animator's timings without his consent is just not something you did back then. Then, there was the whole Mickey thing. Ub felt like he was being treated like an employee, 
when in reality, he was the co-creator of Mickey Mouse and part owner of the studio. According to Ub's wife Mildred, per Jeff Ryan, Ub and Walt were out to eat once when a young fan approached them, asking for a Mickey Mouse sketch. So Walt asked Ub to do it, adding that he, Walt Disney, would then sign it afterwards. Supposedly, Ub then responded by telling Walt something along the lines of, draw your own damn Mickey. There's actually an entire Simpsons episode that pokes fun at Walt Disney's early relationship with Ub Iwerks. And Simonay, Steamboat Itchy, dated 1928. And how Walt kind of erased Ub from Mickey's creation story. He didn't create Itchy, I did. Huh? He stole a character from me in 1928. The episode aired in 1996, which was years before Leslie's documentary came out. It feels fitting, though, in a way, that a cartoon would be quick to give Ub's story such a public nod. All that is to say that in 1930, when a competitor made Ub an offer, he took it. This is also probably a good time for me to introduce a third character here, who's actually been here the whole time, Roy Disney. Walt's brother, who was an incredible businessman and the financial backbone of the Disney studio from the beginning. In 1930, when Ub left Disney to start his own studio, Ub told Roy he was quitting because of personal differences with Walt, and then sold his 20% of the Disney company back to Roy for a measly $3,000. Now, if you do the math on the market capitulation of Disney right now as a company, and you figure out what 20% of that is, it's about $32 billion. But Oob did that for a reason. He wanted to be independent. He wanted to prove that it wasn't Walt's job to make Mickey popular. It was Oob's job to make a new Mickey Mouse. They would see which one of them was the more important to Mickey's success. And that's how two best friends suddenly became competitors, and how Oob's very own creation became the one cartoon he was obsessed with beating. What? No, Mickey Mouse! The 1930s was a good decade for Mickey. He was always family-friendly, charming, dependable, the ultimate American. When he left, I think Mickey became a much more sanitized version. I think Roy Disney called it milk toast, a little milk toast mouse. Even today, Mickey is considered one of the world's most recognizable characters, right up there with Santa Claus. Both, ladies and gentlemen, vote for Mickey Mouse. And make him our next. This is also the decade when we first saw him become a popular writing candidate. An election supervisor in Georgia once said, if Mickey Mouse doesn't get votes in our election, it's a bad election. Part of the reason Mickey was so beloved, though, author Jeff Ryan says, has to do with everything else that was going on at the time. Mickey was introduced in 1928, meaning he was one of the last things people saw in theaters before the Great Depression. And so his optimism was able to carry America through the Great Depression years because they could remember when times were good and Mickey Mouse was part of those good times. Hang on, pal! Here we go! While Walt was building the Disney empire, though, Ub was out on his own, creating something totally new at his newly founded iWorks studio. For the first six months to a year, iWorks was the toast of Hollywood. Ub was so talented that animators flocked to work for him. At one point, he had a staff of 50. But while technically superior in every way, Ub's characters didn't have the same charm that Walt's characters did. Their personalities would change from cartoon to cartoon, and they were all a little devilish. You knew who Mickey Mouse was, but you did not know who Flip the Frog or Willy Whopper were. Not to mention, Ub's characters lived in extremely creative and slightly weird worlds. Leslie Iwerk says her grandfather would play with depth and point of view shots in a way that made it easy to forget you were just looking at a series of drawings. He was always pushing for dimension and a fun way to, to achieve something whimsical. Everything around these characters moved. Ub would animate whole streets, mountains. Bullets would turn around and reverse course mid-shot. Nothing was sacred. He was always pushing, challenging, and exploring artistic boundaries. And sometimes what started off as a fairy tale would turn into an episode of The Twilight Zone. Take Ub's 1935 Balloon Land, for instance. Now beware, have a care, you're just filled with air. 
All of the characters are made out of balloons, and things seem great. Until the cartoon villain, the pincushion man, starts popping small balloon children. So you're not afraid of pins. Ub's animation style ultimately led some people to call him an anarchist. I think anarchist might be a strong word, but it's meant in the kind of a fun way. Ub just didn't follow the rules. At the beginning of American animation, there weren't very many rules. But even when there were rules starting in the mid-30s, he didn't follow those either. Continued to have lots of adult jokes that were very different than what Walt was doing with Mickey. But as the Great Depression dragged on, people started to crave less of Ub's sharp satire. They wanted escapism and characters they could relate to. You probably know Ub well enough at this point to know that he wasn't just animating during all of this time. He was simultaneously coming up with mind-blowing technology. During the 1930s alone, he created the multiplane camera, which added depth of field by creating a moving background behind characters, as well as the very first color cartoon. But as soon as he did that, he went back to black and white because it was just too expensive to keep animating in color. Meanwhile, Walt is continuing to build the Mickey empire with his business acumen and storytelling genius. And it probably won't surprise you to learn that while it was Ub who invented these new technologies, Walt was the one who actually capitalized on them. Walt, despite the fact that he had lost his his animation genius, had enough money so that he could eventually switch over to color and to do it right. Three strip Technicolor instead of two strip, which is what Ub was using. Walt Disney Studios eventually did a similar thing with Ub's multiplane camera. In the end, Jeff says Ub might have had more talent, but Walt had more money and more to say. In 1938, Ub admitted defeat and closed up shop. It ended up being a huge turning point in his life. After two decades of animating, the challenge for him was gone. He decided he'd rather solve technical problems in the film industry full time. And when Walt heard about all of this, he figured it was about time to, as people say, get the band back together. So in 1940, Ub Iwerks returned to Walt Disney Studios as a problem solver, 10 years after he left it as an animator. Did things ever go back to the way things were? It's hard to say. Those 10 years apart were strained for them. But Jeff says men didn't talk about their emotions back then. So he thinks the chances are slim that they had any kind of big talk about it. So I think neither Oob nor Walt wanted to sit down on the couch and figure out what went wrong for the 10 years where they didn't talk. They were just happy that they were both back working side by side. Leslie, for one, doesn't think it was hard for them to get back to where they had left things. She feels confident that Walt fully welcomed her grandfather back and that Ub didn't have any lingering hard feelings. I think it was something that they immediately became tight again and trustworthy again. The two worked closely together for the next 26 years. Reporting directly to Walt, Ub's responsibilities extended to all aspects of post-production special effects, giving Disney an edge on other animation companies for decades to come. Then, in 1966, Walt Disney died at the age of 65. Leslie interviewed her dad, Don Iwerks, about it for her documentary. That was a day that I'll remember forever because we happened to be down on the shop floor and to come over the radio and our secretary went over the PA system and announced it through the shop that Walt had just passed away. Don was working with Ub at Disney at the time. And his words were, that's the end of an era. Not only did he lose a friend, but he lost that person to whom he was dedicated to please. And then in 1971, Ub Iwerks died from a heart attack at the age of 70. With few people outside of the world of animation knowing about his contributions to Mickey Mouse. I think a lot of that has to do with the way that Disney over the years has controlled the, the Mickey Mouse narrative. It would be another 18 years before Ub received the title of Disney legend. And it would be another 28 years before his granddaughter's documentary about his contributions to Mickey Mouse came out. What's especially interesting about Leslie's documentary, though, is that it was published by Disney because of Walt's nephew, Roy E. Disney, 
who shared the name of Disney Studios co-founder Roy Disney. Roy had a lot of respect for Ub and really felt like he was not represented strong enough in the Disney history. And if you look at it that way, the Walt Disney Company did eventually tell the true origin story of Mickey Mouse. It just took them 70 years or so. Today, 55 years after his death, Walt Disney is still just as much of an icon around the world, and especially here in Kansas City, where the old laugh gram studio building is currently being renovated just off 31st and Troost. When I updated Leslie Iwerks on the most recent plans for her grandfather's old studio, she was excited. She told me she hoped that they were keeping it to the original look as much as possible. This is the concrete. Well, I'm happy to report that they are. When I met up with the Thank You Walt Disney crew last month, they were in the midst of choosing a motor color. It was extremely exciting. Does anyone know which way we're leaning? We're leaning in the middle in a pinkish, reddish color that was uh, as close to the original as we can uh, best determine. That's Butch Rigby again. He says the new building will have a museum space dedicated to telling the story of Walt Disney, in addition to the other Kansas City animators that helped build the foundation of American animation. Ub Iwerks is equally as important here. He was a partner in that company, and I think this building is the story of Ub Iwerks as much as Walt Disney. Obviously, everybody's going to know the name Walt Disney, and everybody's going to be learning the name Ub Iwerks, but what a great part of the learning experience. The building will also have a co-working space and a digital media training center, where they hope to have workshops and education resources to train the future media talent of Kansas City. Their executive director told me that they usually start kids off with stop-motion animation, a class that feels especially fitting to house at this particular location. For me, looking at these two elements side by side, entrepreneurship and digital media, it feels like a nod to Walt and Ub's partnership. Uh, Walt was pretty good about keeping that bar high and continuing to move it up. And Ub was the person that figured out how you were actually going to get things done so that you could begin to have movies that were an inspiration. Gary Sage is the head of the Building Development Committee. And for him, just talking about all of this brings up a heavy dose of nostalgia. Back in the 1950s, it was every Sunday night you'd turn on Walt Disney, and every time it was something that was inspiring with regard to the emotional content of it. It's when you look at the body of work they produced over the years that it becomes truly staggering how key this one collaboration was to decades of stories and characters. Oh yes, this started back in Kansas City, Missouri. And how it all started right here. Walt, just what is an animator? An animator is an artist who makes the drawings move. He puts them through their paces. He has to be a real student of art. Now we were dealing in, in motion, movement, the flow of movement, the flow of things, you know, action, reaction, all of that. But don't you remember? We've met before. We, we have? Well, of course. Once upon a dream. In the end, the story of Mickey Mouse is a good reminder for us all. Everything is a team effort. Behind every powerful mouse, there might be a Walt, but behind every Walt, there's probably at least one up. Mackenzie Martin is a producer at KCUR Studios. This is the final episode of A People's History of Kansas City Season 2, so I hope you've enjoyed it. We're going to take a little break, but stay tuned to the feed for more amazing local history stories. And if you haven't already, check out the rest of our previous episodes about other Kansas City underdogs. A People's History of Kansas City is a production from KCUR Studios with the support of the Mid-Continent Public Library. For further reading about Ub Iwerks, check out Leslie Iwerks' documentary, The Hand Behind the Mouse. She also wrote a book with that same title. And another great book is A Mouse Divided by Jeff Ryan and Walt Disney's Ultimate Inventor by Don Iwerks. If you want to email me with ideas, feedback, say hi or whatever, you can write me Suzanne, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E at kcur.org. 
Music this episode from Fletcher Henderson, Benny Moten's Kansas City Orchestra, Glenn Miller, and Blue Dot Sessions, in addition to many other iconic classic cartoons. Our team is Mackenzie Martin, Mike Russo, Byron Love, Ann Knigendorf, Barb Shelley, Cody Newell, and Krista Henthorne. I'm Suzanne Hogan. Take care and thanks for listening. <laughs>